<clears throat> evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, I would like to read an excerpt from Roger Scruton's England analogy for educational purposes only, and then perhaps talk a bit about the de-schooling of the university, the necessary de-schooling, the Verschulung der Universität, the schoolification of the university, certainly been one of the major detrimental impacts or forces on, on the university, which is now becoming a school. Of course, the word school is also perverted because school comes from the Greek skolē, uh, measure of sufficiency, the realm in which the human being dwells in unison and harmony with, with nature. That which allows, through its measure of sufficiency, for, as Plato says in the Cretius, for mythology, a knowledge and love of the old and the wisdom of old, a cherishing of the gods and one's ancestors. To school or the schoolification of the university means that it attracts, of course, you know, as a massification of the university, the university is supposed to attract more and more people for the sake of so-called equality and uh, equal access to equal opportunities, etc., 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 which uh, in countries where tuition fees are very high, actually just means to create more cash cows and more debt slaves, to be quite honest with you. And I, um, but of course, you know, once you have standardized testing, once you have standardized, not just testing, but you, once you have standardized um, the entire operation, you have actually uh, a very wonderful factory, a sausage factory, where you can produce standardized human beings who will leave university um, believing themselves to be quite intelligent and well read because they've read all, they've had, uh, they've read all the right books, or probably they haven't read any books at all. Um, but they were never, ever, even just once challenged. This is something that you can notice in the classroom is that you're supposed to make the customer happy. Do not challenge them, which means, however, do not take them seriously as individuals. They need not defend their thoughts because they are so feeble and meek, these wonderful little flowers, that if you challenge them, well, they will give you a bad ranking. And as a young lecturer, that means that you have just killed your career. So everything is great and wonderful. By the way, I've never done that. Um, and I don't do this when I teach privately. I will say no. When I, either when I think that it's rubbish or when I think that you must defend it better. And I would expect the same. And my best teachers were the strictest. I will not mention any names, but I had very strict teachers, very strict PhD supervisor. And well, it did me. So here I'm going to read now from Roger Scruton's England and Elegy. So, nothing else was required of the student in the humanities apart from the weekly or sometimes twice weekly essay. Lectures, which were arranged by the university and not by the college, were optional. It was up to the lecturer to interest the students. Should he fail to do so, then he would find himself talking to an empty hall. The advice often given to the new undergraduate was to attend the best lectures, in whatever subject they happened to be. Although reading philosophy at Cambridge, many of the lectures I attended were given by the departments of English, Modern Greek and German. It was not unknown for an undergraduate to be awarded a first-class degree without ever having attended a lecture. The important thing was to read, to write and to defend 
what you had written during that crucial hour of advocacy and interrogation. Because what he describes versus Scruton just before is that once or twice a week you took your essay to your supervisor and the supervisor's duty was to read the weekly essay and then to sit down face to face face to face with its perpetrator for an hour doing his best to compel the student to defend what he had written this incompatible discipline was responsible for all that was best in higher education in England. The independence of judgment, seriousness of attitude, and ability to make a case and defend it, which were the marks of the educated English mind. Nothing else was required of the student in the humanities apart from this essay. There was another and equally important consequence of collegiate organization, Scruton continues, which was the unprecedented academic freedom that the fellows enjoyed. In modern universities, academic posts are available only to those who are working in some recognized subject, with a faculty and a curriculum of its own. In the Cambridge that I knew, and this is not too long ago when you think about it, many of the fellows were attached to no university faculty at all, and pursued researches that no university bureaucracy today would endorse with a grant or stipend. This freedom extended to undergraduates too. Since undergraduates were admitted by the college and not by the university, they were free to fashion their own career. And I remember how difficult it was when I was a student in London to take a, a course at another college. The University of London officially is one and with all the different colleges because they're all now in competition. So they make it not impossible, but difficult. Um, which is a bit bizarre when you think about it. So, I went up, Scruton continues, to Cambridge with a scholarship in the natural sciences, my intention having been to study biochemistry. But during my year of wandering prior to university, I had acquired an interest in literature and distinct aversion to the natural sciences. And so he was able to study what was then called the moral sciences, philosophy which is how he discovered his vocation. But with a scholarship in the natural sciences, not with a, a scholarship then as it is today that requires you uh, to, to specify the production outcome most efficiently, even before you begin the research. It's quite funny when you write a research grant, you already know the outcome. That's the funniest thing, right? You already know the outcome, then you get the grant. So, and he then describes, I would highly recommend this passage in his book. Uh, he then describes his uh, teacher, um, who was basically all over the place. A man of letters who was um, interested and well-read in Baroque keyboard ornamentation, the vinification of Burgundy, wave structure of the benzene ring, and translations of the Confucian Odes. He knew of, the, of Fraser's theory of magic and of the chronology of Cavalcanti, and the very irrelevance to the surrounding world of everything he knew. Irrelevance, do you hear? Irrelevant. The school today does not want you to have so-called irrelevant uh, knowledge. By the way, how do you, how do you not notice of yourself whether you've been properly schooled? Um, and expect some sort of a schooling, even if you're now in, around independently, is when you demand the clear-cut ism. It's when you want the cookie cutter to come and deliver and uh, tell you exactly in bullet point version what to think and uh, what this ism is, etc., etc. Now, it's striking also that... Um, Latin and Greek and ancient history were at the heart of the old curriculum, as Richard Scruton here describes. And literature was studied through classical texts. And I think what the next step over the next coming years, after the first year of Halcyon, uh, will be for me is to have someone teach Latin and Greek courses. To have at least some... It's, it's questionable whether how it would be possible... Because to study Greek is, is a 
is a full-time engagement over two years. But uh, I do believe that at least learning some of the basics should be possible to have um, a foundational course in Latin and Greek. This is uh, something I, I'd like to uh, work towards. So, and something very important that Scruton says, the further the subject seemed from the day-to-day -day concerns of the student, the more worthy of study was it held to be. The more impractical, the more resolute a devotion to the impractical was shown to have an unseen effect, which is a true test of the student's competent and knowledge to defend him or herself. And the, this is before the standardization of the curriculum. Of course, even up until today, th thankfully, um, many universities do not have standardized texts in the humanities, but actually you're required to write an essay. Of course, very often quite standardized essays. Um, so the de-schooling of, of, of the universities would then mean to let them be free again from the standardization which they have been suffering from. It's questionable, of course, whether that would be possible, whether a return to this, uh, not even that old world. It's probably, I would reckon that Scrooge probably studied in the 50s or 60s. Um, is perhaps possible. Again, if it isn't possible within the universities, then we must not let it die and we must keep it alive somewhere else. It should be very possible today. There are very good people out there who are doing very good work in this regard. And um, I think they will naturally find each other in this, in this decade. So um, again, thank you very much for listening. And I hope to see you all very soon indeed. Goodbye.